Before I begin, I'm going to warn you that there will be spoilers. If you haven't seen 2019's The Evil Down the Street, I recommend that you do so and come back. It's available to stream and worth the watch. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of the Bad Movie Bunny podcast, where horror and thrillers are reviewed, but is the next scream that you hear your own. My name is Lisa, or the Bad Movie Bunny, and on this episode, we will get possessed and eat cake with the evil down the street. Written by David J. Espinoza and Craig Ahrens, directed by David J. Espinoza, and starring Kelton Jones and Alina Gerard, while we ask the burning question, do realtors need to disclose if there were a demon or other paranormal presences while selling a house? The answer might surprise you. Let's get into it. It's a haunted dream house, Charlie Brown. Well, not quite. A family of four makes a fresh start in a new home. Little did they know that the realtor forgot one little detail. It's possessed by a demon. We start off with a moving van, and a mover making lewd comments about a massage to the mother, Katie, played by Alina Gerard, as the father, Michael, played by Kelton Jones, notes an old car that looks a little out of place in the neighborhood. As the family settles in, one of their two daughters, Maddie, played by Sophia Sparks, notices a large chest in the basement with a Ouija board and crystal ball. Nothing too old or ornate. They look a little like Halloween decorations one can get at any Target or Party City. Maddie picks it up, and all of a sudden the basement door is stuck. But wait a second, isn't this a newer house? New neighbors, the Lawfords, played by Craig Ahrens and Deborah Romelia, come to call with cookies and news of the previous owners. Gossip, really. The couple talks over each other, but one Mrs. Harris went from gardening to not leaving the house to a mental breakdown. Oh, and by the way, the Lawfords are having a barbecue next week. Michael decides to get more info on the previous owners from another neighbor. All he gets is a comment about trying not to end up in the state hospital. Now, does anyone else get a feeling that while the neighbors are curious about the new residents, they seem to want to keep key information about the previous owners under wraps? I for one wanted to know what kind of gardener Mrs. Harris was. I can't keep the hardiest of plants alive, and I'm referring to citronella, you guys. I am going to note that the newest residents of this house are making coffee from a fancy appliance. I am not saying that this is a factor in demons sticking around, but Katie had a cup up and ready. Michael was probably not the only one declaring, bless you, just saying. There is another motive to that kick-ass coffee. The family hears stuff in the walls, and as a result have not been sleeping so well. To start, the viewer hears squeaking noises throughout the house. It sounds a little like birds, but what was it really? Michael heads down to that same basement. Well, nothing too weird is in there, but Maddie left it a mess, right down to the Ouija board, in plain view. To Michael, that stuff had no place in the house and needed to be thrown out. Yet Maddie and her sister Kristen, played by Tara Milanti, were playing with it right in that very weird basement like nothing was wrong. But Bo should know better. But it isn't possessed. Not really. Katie busts both girls and takes the Ouija board herself. Nothing could happen there, right? Right. Katie starts to hear laughter in the walls. I got a sense that she knew it wasn't her daughter's. Even when Kristen shows up looking for Maddie as the source of the laughter... Katie shrugs it off. Those large houses, they sure have a life of their own, am I right? And now it is time for the family adventure in the form of a hike. But Michael had better not open those blinds as the bright sunny day is far too bright for Katie. Hmm, nothing off about this at all. Oh no, Katie's staying home and all questions about this are avoided. Everyone's just hearing things and blowing off the obvious. Except when the family returns, Katie's not in the best state. She's pretty obsessively playing with the Ouija board in the basement, and even suggests playing with it with Michael as an 
after hours event when the kids turn in. I mean, Katie is in a state of undress when she suggests this, and red lighting came into play. One can surmise that she and the demon have been reading Cosmo. Okay. Like the matriarch previous owner of the house before her, slowly but surely, Katie is possessed and her family starts to feel it. Heaven help Michael in his wandering of the house late at night when Katie states right at the stairwell that he needs to come to bed right now. She sounds pretty strange, but doesn't remember any of it the next day. She slept like a log, even though it scared the hell out of Michael. And what was he doing at his computer? Apparently, Michael did not find what he was looking for on Google, so he asked Bill Lawford what landed Mrs. Harris in the hospital. Lawford doesn't know for sure, but he has the name of a priest, namely Father Bob, played by David J. Espinosa. Turns out, Father Bob had wanted to know who bought the house, and had asked Bill to turn over his information to those new owners. Guess the consultations with the previous owner perturbed the man? Well, the daughters are perturbed. Mom is sleeping in the middle of the afternoon. And she's not looking so good when she wakes up and asks the girls how school was. And then starts talking about potatoes. When the family doesn't ever have potatoes. Alright, that's a little weird, wanting root, random root vegetables. This family's in trouble. The girls need to talk to Dad, and Dad should call a priest. Damn those peelings! No schoolgirl in suburbia should ever be subjected to this. But the girls went too far in potato peeling and prep, according to Katie, who seems a little focused on the potatoes. Possessed, maybe. Father Bob can't come by for consultation fast enough. But first, Michael decides to consult the Lawfords and other neighbors. Sure, the previous owners were normal and social before the house, or rather before they tore down the house, built a new one, but left the creepy demon basement behind, board game, crystal ball, the whole shebang. For the grandkids were coming to visit in the summer, according to Mrs. Lawford. To hear her tell it, it wasn't so much the previous owners, but that weird couple who had the house before them that caused all the trouble. There were parties. Private parties. And if you look just right, not that Mrs. Lawford did, oh no! You could see guests wearing black robes with hoods. There was some seance action, and that couple sold the house. I guess it was board game night. Ouija board game night, apparently. And now, it has affected Katie and concerned Michael. Katie was concerned that Michael was consulting the neighbors. So she walked on in to clear things up. No, she was intimidating people. Mrs. Lawford was all about the excuses at that point. Be that as it may, Father Bob, as opposed to neighborly gossip, was needed as Katie's behavior is deteriorating. Even her tossing and turning in sleep got scary. Or it could be what Michael heard about the house. And then we get the random laughter that the kids hear in the early morning hours, and the sight of their mom talking to something unseen, laughing, and removing part of her robe before entering her daughter's room and hovering for a bit. Oh, yikes. Katie only goes downhill from there, and it was time for Michael to call Father Bob while he was at mid-morning push-ups. But Father Bob knew that Bill Lawford gave Michael his information and why, so he is more than willing to attend a nice family dinner and possibly try to bless the house with his grizzled film noir detective voice. Katie insists that not only does the house not need a blessing, but Father Bob has better things to do than, well, his job. Maybe some pull-ups. Michael feels that a family road trip is in order. Kristen begs off due to cramps, 
and a need to find Party City occult items in the house. Maddie, pissy about having to go, goes to get Katie, who needs to stay in the house. This angers Michael, who storms in only to see Katie chug-a-lugging some morning vodka, resulting in him shouting that she's going, no questions, and that there will be a priestly dinner guest later in the evening. Kristen, in the meantime, starts searching for the Ouija board. While traveling, Katie insists that everyone return home for her phone, to a point where she tenses up and you start to hear a demonic echo in her voice. I'm guessing that the Nextdoor app is some next-level social media addiction. And Katie did not strike me as a Pinterest kind of demon host. Now Kristen, who has found the Ouija board in her mom's stuff, is facing demonic grounding, as mom knows, and is not happy. Father Bob arrives later that evening, but before he can talk much, Katie insists that everyone eats and tenses up as he blesses the food and invites the family to his church. Katie places emphasis on how the house, which looks a little like an Ikea display, needs her full attention. And God help any clergyman that tries to get in her way. The girls wish to retire early, leaving Father Bob to inform Michael that there is a demon in the house, and it possessed Katie, who is now drinking wine with an invisible friend. That demon seems to know a lot about Father Bob and his pants-wedding days, and craves cake. Devil's food, of course. One has to have that extra bit of awkward when company comes over. More weird noises in the night follow. Pretty soon, it is time for the freeloading, non-rent-paying demon to either pick up a utility bill or vacate the premises. They say that house guests and fish start to smell and overstay their welcome after about three days. Demons possessing human hosts start to stink and cause drama on day one, so it is back to see Father Bob, who suggests a group of clergy dedicated to demon hunting called Deliverance Ministry. Part of me thought of dueling banjos, but Michael takes some literature, and Father Bob comes over again to try to exercise Katie's demon through prayer. The echo in her voice amplifies, and I liked the effect used to simulate the demon, but was expecting more of a battle, but prayer and the noir detective delivery of Father Bob seemingly did it and just in time for church on Sunday. The curtain closing in an alcove suggested that the demon opted to sleep in. Well, call me a New England girl, but I'm kind of picky when it comes to these kind of haunted house movies. That said, this was a solid and enjoyable possession in haunted house movie. Truth is stranger than fiction, and it's not just a cliche sometimes. What I ultimately liked was that it felt more like a mystery story, but it was inspired by a real-life family that had a case of possession. Plus, how about how well those simple crystal ball and board game props were used? This being said, I am a snooty reviewer from Connecticut that has seen Lorraine Warren speak at my modest state college. As I said, I am picky about my haunted house flicks, and this movie got a little slow-paced. Plus, 2017's Veronica, available on Netflix, taking place in Spain and based on true events in the early 1990s, is one of my favorite movies of all time. So I might have set a higher bar with The Evil Down the Street. And that Ouija board was just too readily available to the cast. On the other hand, it worked very well. Sure, it looked like innocent holiday gags, even basic, something anyone could get at Party City. But how else would you get your average suburbanite that wasn't into occult props to pay attention otherwise? I like the grizzled Father Bob, but he had a pretty easy fight with that demon. He mentions a ministry of demon hunters, but they never show up, and he could have knocked out that demon during that first dinner and had a second helping of cake afterward. 
The first thing that sent my tropey senses tingling was Maddie's first venture into her new basement as the rest of the family's moving. Right off the bat, she slowly approaches a chest with your typical occult items, which looked like a crystal ball and Ouija board purchase for trick-or-treaters. Yet, what looks innocent is a little conduit to the paranormal. They are occult-themed, after all. It made a fairly interesting touch, and a good jump start to the demonic elements in this movie. As to fun facts about production and soundtracks, I didn't see any soundtrack information, or much of one in the movie, but I thought I'd seen Sophia Sparks before, and I couldn't place her until I did a little digging for this episode. She was in a few investigation discovery specials that I, along with other true crime buffs scratching their heads, will have seen her in Aaron Hernandez, an ID murder mystery as Jaylene, or as Karen Rosario in ID Presents 9 at 9. Now, as to the burning question, do realtors have to disclose a demon in the house? I did a little bit of internet research on this, and I found something interesting on Zillow.com. From an article published on October 29, 2019, it talks about what realtors have to tell potential buyers about certain paranormal or demonic activities state by state. In most states, if there is a chance that you are purchasing a haunted house, the realtor does not have to disclose this. However, if you're buying in New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, or Minnesota, it gets a little tricky. In New Jersey, if a buyer asks if the house is haunted, realtors must disclose if this is the case. In New York State, courts will rescind home sales if it turns out that the seller is perpetuating a reputation that the house is haunted and takes advantage of the buyer's lack of knowledge of this. Now let's say you invite ghost hunters to the house then later sell the property to people who want nothing to do with ghosts and who wouldn't have bought the place if they knew, you know, what kind of non-electric bill play paying housemate was in residence, that sale would have been voided. Massachusetts and Minnesota would mention paranormal activity as a factor that could be a quote-unquote psychologically affected attribute, even if this could cause stigma or psychological impact that might affect sales. I will note that nine states need to disclose death on the property, some within a few years, um, Connecticut being one of them, if asked. I'll also note that in Texas, none of these need be disclosed. This one's interesting, as I vended at an artist market located at a haunted Texas inn. I met other wonderful artists, and while walking around the inn, saying hello to other attendees and vendors, I caught the faint smell of tobacco. Not your usual secondhand smoke from your regular cigarettes, but the scent of tobacco leaves. No one was smoking near me, and I didn't see any vents. Did a spirit walk that same hallway with a pipe? Or was it a gimmick? I don't know. If any realtors are listening and have any interesting things that one would disclose to a buyer, or any inaccuracies to what I just discussed, please leave a comment or write me on my Twitter or email. Thus ends this episode of the Bad Movie Bunny podcast. If you'd like to find more content, you can visit my blog at www.badmoviebunnies.com or follow me on Twitter or Twitch as Bad Movie Bunnies. Who knows, I may pop on for a video game live stream. Until then, thank you for listening, and tune in next time.